This is episode 17 of the Think Data podcast in partnership with DataWorks. And today I am pleased to welcome Vinesh Sukumar to the show. Vinesh has a wealth of experience in product management and artificial intelligence and has worked for the likes of NASA, Intel, Lenovo, and most recently Qualcomm, where he is currently the senior director for AI and ML product management. He is also a member of the board of advisors for the AI Forum and is also an AI advisor to San Francisco and California State University. Welcome to the show, and I do appreciate you taking time out of your uh, your busy schedule to speak with us. And uh, you've obviously got a really interesting background because I think it was 2001, you started off, you joined NASA, I believe, in kind of a, was an engineering capacity, but then over the years have progressed, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of AI and product. Can you give us a bit of a background to you and and what ultimately brought you to Qualcomm? Thanks, Alex, uh, for having me on the show. Um, and, a, and a great question to begin with. Um, and as you mentioned, I uh, actually started my professional career working for Jet Proportional Labs. Uh, those days, it was all about, you know, uh, uh, designing circuit boards, trying to look at uh, getting uh, camera sensors integrated into, you know, big space missions like uh, the Jupiter missions kind of thing and then try to extract information from those big cameras and then try to articulate and make sense of the information it pro, you know it produces but it was very manual in nature you know to a large extent i would say that was my foray into computer vision with computer vision those days was you know you know drawing boxes identifying this is a tree this is a building this is a garden kind of stuff obviously very manual um and you know it, it became quite obvious that this is not the most productive way of getting things fast and classifying things much more faster. And those days there was no mention of artificial intelligence. You know, everything came up quite new. Those days it's mm. only about object detection, object classification kind of stuff. Now with time, you know, we wanted to automate stuff and that's where we started to get into elements of coding. Um, those days using Fortran, C, C++ kind of language and try to understand, you know, how can you make, the, you know, uh, this kind of classification detection jobs much more easier. I guess that's when you know computer vision 1.0 started to be, be yeah. semi automated using uh, you know a very simple um, uh, code base. I think uh, with time uh, my interest in computer vision grew and also as I started to complete my doctoral research thesis in that subject I thought maybe I can add value uh, by putting a lot more focus and just not from a research perspective but also from a consumer electronics field perspective. And you know that's how I started getting into into, uh, I would say, uh, Intel, um, Lenovo, and many other firms, and finally landed in Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm had this amazing, uh, amazing opportunity, I would say, wherein they had mentioned, wherein, you know, I could be uh, driving the vision and strategy for Qualcomm, you know, thinking blue sky, and obviously yeah. working with some talented engineering and research folks, translate that blue sky vision into uh, execution and reality, right, and which I love. And uh, that's how I think it all started and you know, having some good times at Qualcomm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing journey. I, I'm thinking probably NASA 22 years ago is probably a very different place to NASA now. And I'm guessing it's interesting you touched on the computer vision part and the, the conceptual, theoretical kind of AI that was very much kind of was being practiced back then, but naturally wasn't called artificial intelligence it was obviously how did you describe that internally then because i know obviously image detection classification and all that is classic kind of data science machine learning type uh concepts but back then at nasa what, what was that viewed as i think it was pretty much quite simple in terms of you know uh detecting objects detecting you know pictorial content and then mm. being able to deduce information from the pictorial content when you look at even uh uh, artificial intelligence has a large amount of foundation on classical vision or computer vision kind of stuff, right? Mm. And from then on, from pictorial, it went on to video-based information or video analytics. From video analytics, people putting a lot more focus on speech, audio, text, now linguistics, commerce, and you can think of any given modality and you can see the footprint of AI all over the place. But I would say to a large extent, AI started off with pictorial content because there was the most amount of information available at that point of time. And mm. to be able to deduce uh, some meaningful uh, context, it was quite important to really understand what it meant, right? Um, and I think, you know, that was quite helpful. And in those days, it's, you know, it was not um, difficult to gather information, right? 
the most important thing is, you know, you have a ton of information. How do you label it uh, so that you can do some meaningful conclusions from it? And I think that was a major problem statement those days. Now, obviously, things are very different. You have a ton of data. And the question really becomes is, how do you, you know, use this labeled data and then uh, semi-automate things, you know, in different domains? Yeah, interesting. I think uh, for people who are listening uh, to, to the show now is, Qualcomm may not necessarily be a household name which people will instantly recognize, but ultimately, who are they and why is generative AI becoming such an important element of their product roadmap for companies like Qualcomm? I think a great question. I think uh, Qualcomm historically has been viewed as a communication company. If you look at it, it has been a strong presence from 1G, 2G, LTE, 4G, 5G kind of spectrum. And I think- yeah. Uh, made a very uh, strong presence. Now, one thing as part of that presence is they've also expanded footprint in many verticals. Historically, very modem-centric, uh, but for modem, obviously, went on to uh, mobile, IoT, PC compute, automotive, VR, AR. So pretty much you can see a footprint on all you know uh, edge-based devices, which are very really critical and important for a consumer. Now, what that puts us is, you know, you happen to, have a leadership from an edge deployment standpoint. And you also happen to have various technologies that help access data of the user. Now, it mm. becomes very important in the space of AI is A, um, user uh, data needs to be resident within the device. We strongly believe at Qualcomm that this is sensitive information. It should not be sent to the cloud unless it deemed necessary. So if you happen to have access to user-defined data, can you come back with meaningful conclusions uh, given the technologies that's available as part of an SOC is what we try to do, is one. And second thing is, uh, can I move towards a very uh, customized inference, meaning whatever conclusions I kind of come up with, can it be mapped to the user's preferences? An example here would be is, uh, uh, if I'm asking something about George Washington, right? There has to be a difference between me and a six-year-old and a 65-year-old. If you get the same response without mapping that response to the emotional intelligence of the user or the environmental conditions, it becomes very stale data, right? You're mm. not able to connect to the user. So we at Qualcomm believe that with the amount of investment we have on the edge, if we're able to produce conclusions that's meaningful to the user so that the interest of the user continues to uh, stay high, then we have achieved something really big. That's how Qualcomm is trying to push for it. Um, we have a strong footprint, as I mentioned, on the edge-based devices and giving those various technologies we're trying to put the next uh, forefront into generative AI. And obviously, generative AI is a very broad term. It could include large language models, uh, large vision models. Large vision models is all about stable diffusion that even my you know mom seems to be using these days and creating some fantastic pictures. <laughs> uh, it's everywhere. Pictures and, <laughs> yeah, and she just keeps sending me pictures every 10 minutes, irritating me. But uh, at least, you know, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it, I get excited because, you know, these days, generative AI is even touching a 65-year-old lady, um, which makes AI much more relevant these days. So I'm happy from that standpoint. That's really interesting. You're talking about how that information is kind of delivered to the user, because I think you're right, kind of AI is obviously front and center of so many discussions. You're right, you know, my mum's, you know, asked me the other day what chat GBT was because her friends were talking about it. It's really gathered some momentum, but you're completely right in the sense that if you're delivering an answer to give you a simple request for information, but it's it's kind of delivered in the same way to all the, the audience, the, the, the same way to the audience, then their engagement levels will tend to vary if they say a young as a six-year-old versus a 65-year-old lady, as you rightly said. So you, without, I suppose, going into too much detail, I don't know if you can, but how is that being operated from Qualcomm's side from, from an AI standpoint? How, how are they ensuring that information is being delivered and tailored to the right audience? Uh, I think uh, um, we're trying to move away from the fact of very generic inference to a personalized inference, as I mentioned before. Yeah. Personalized inference by large means that you need to extract information about the user. But again, whatever uh, information you get about the user resides within the device. It does not transition from the device. What I mean by saying that is what are the behavioral traits? What are the behavioral preferences? You know, what kind of input prompts that they're actually looking for? What kind of output information they desire? And you kind of build this information with time. It's like, you know, acting like a personal assistant. 
and that personal assistant get tuned to the character or the behavioral traits of the user. And once that information is set up, you know, by doing a lot of uh, on-device training, on-device learning, then you start to see a lot of, um, you know, output information being shared with the user becomes very customized for the user. Mm. It is not a thing that you it, it does in a day, uh, but, you know, with over a period of time of use, it becomes quite customized. Um, and, you know, we have been doing this for quite some time and we strongly believe with the investments you've had over the years, this kind of lays the foundation to, um, to would say, more of you know, a dedicated and a customized and slash personalized inference rather than a generic inference that you see today. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's um, having a more tailored kind of offering is, is just going to increase the adoption rates, is going to increase the engagement rates and subsequently the use rates of that product anyway. So yeah, it's really, uh, really fascinating. And I think obviously you've been, uh, I, I kind of got this wrong originally when it was kind of, a, you know, AI and you were kind of been, it's kind of been together for nine years, but actually what you refer to as kind of NASA, you know, 22 years ago was probably the early stage of that. But are there any kind of projects or kind of use cases that stand out from your kind of, 20 plus years working in this space? Yeah, I think when I look at it, you know, to a large extent, uh, AI didn't really have common sense. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. uh, very uh, zero and one, right? You train it to do a certain things and it does exactly what you're supposed to do, right? But now we're kind of pushing towards the fact is, uh, can AI be infused with knowledge graphs? Can it understand the context before it makes a prediction? These are kind of really difficult things to do. Uh, but, you know, it needs to happen for AI to be much more relevant to the user. Now, mm. people keep asking me that, are you creating something like uh, a Terminator 2 kind of environment? <laughs> well, <laughs> no. not necessarily. <laughs> Hope, <laughs> we're not getting there, you know, hopefully not, at least in my lifetime. Uh, but, you know, you, you want these machines to be intelligent enough. Now, having said that, for the last 20 years, we have made a lot of jumps. Um, you know, uh, when we started looking at, you know, basic computer vision stuff, right? As I mentioned, it was about drawing boxes and then classifying those boxes to be, you know, uh, what it's supposed to do, you know, classifying objects, classifying scenery, classifying buildings. And those days, you know, that was the need of the R, right? Uh, we were able to successfully complete that. And from then on, the intention was to automate it so that, you know, it has less of a human intervention. And I think we reasonably did that well. And then with time, the question was, can I use that same intelligence and put it to a different use case, especially in the, in the, you know, in terms of voices or text, wherein can I just change the last layers of a convolution network and classify voices or classify text? And we were able to successfully do that by a concept called transfer learn, right? So I think, uh, you know, as you move forward a little bit more, the question really becomes, okay, this is great. You know, you're looking fantastic in object. You're looking fantastic in linguistics, text. Uh, can I do multimodal? Right, and I think uh, we were able to successfully demonstrate that with the combination of voice and uh, an image. But with time, you know, uh, as more data became available, it became much more, in, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, informative, and people became more informative, I should say. Mm. The request was to see if, um, what could be the trends of AI, right? And this is where we started getting more into training, customized training, those kind of stuff. and. Now you can come up with large language models, language vision models to create fake data, you know, to classify, you know, um, text automatically, those kind of stuff. So I think the next six months, you're going to see a lot more evolution on the Gen AI space. Uh, and I'm excited to see that because um, uh, OpenAI, uh, to a large extent, opened up to the world of possibilities, I would yeah. say about nine months ago. And from then on, the boom has completely changed. Right, it's, so it's gone crazy, it, isn't it? I think exactly. it's you've only got to look into the market now of how many generative AI startups, how much funding is flowing around, and uh, it's almost like that kind of post kind of cloud boom where everyone's kind of getting on the bandwagon. You got the Snowflake IPO. You had all these companies that were gathering so much attention, and I that's also come in. Um, in sync with the rise in the demand for dedicated, technically minded product teams, of which obviously you're running at the moment. What do you think's behind that? Because we've seen, you know, the the uh, amount of vacancies, the amount of appetite, and subsequent 
low supply of quality ML and AI product managers is is creating an interesting interesting market at the moment. But why do you think so many companies are building dedicated product teams which are specifically aligned to AI? I think uh, it's important as a product manager to be successful is to you know, think as a user, right? Mm. What would be the pain points of a user? What are the key experience indicators? How do you define success? Some of them are quite abstract in nature, uh, but you have to position yourself and what is going to sell. How do you connect to the user, right? And if you're able to make that pitch in a much more simplistic way, you would be successful as a product manager, and especially in AI, where things are very abstract. Uh, it's important to kind of lay the foundations of success. Mm -hmm. What I mean by saying that is, um, let's talk about the, in the space of even generative AI. You know, there's a lot of conversations about foundational models. You have llama, vicuna, alpaca, all the animals in the zoo being named on foundational <laughs> models. Right? But people don't understand these are foundational models to begin with, meaning they could do a lot of generic tasks. They're working on unlabeled and structured data. But if you want to make it very task specific, you want to make it very domain specific. These foundational models are not meant for that. So in that case, you know, the product manager needs to put a hat on and then try to understand, you know, if I'm going towards some kind of a financial transaction that needs, let's say, chat GPT kind of performance, if I'm going to health industry that needs a chat GPT like performance, would a large foundation model work good enough? If it is not, how do I define those KPIs? And maybe I need to have task specific training to be established or fine tuning. These kind of metrics and definitions, I think is important for a product. And once you establish it, you can have that level of engagement with various engineering and research teams to deliver that, right? And it's quite possible the very first product you deliver not going to be successful. Now, you don't aim for perfection in the first release, right? Mm. That's the nature of the business. You again, you know, try to put it out there, try to get some feedback, actively work on it, and then constantly make improvements. But to also be a successful product manager, I would strongly recommend there needs to be some amount of dynamic tension, you know, within the internal engineering groups, right? Because they always try to get the best out of you and you try to get the best out of them, right? And that's how the product wins the end. Mm. So I think, you know, as long as these traits are followed, uh, you know, it, it's going to work out well and especially in a domain like AI. Yeah, yeah. But they don't always get it right though, do they? Because I think companies, it's like a snowball effect, isn't it? That, that one company set up a dedicated team then all of a sudden, the next company wants to do it. So, in your experience, you know, you work for large organisations. You've you've gone into companies and established these functions. What, what are some of the key challenges, kind of these product teams usually face, and subsequently, how do they overcome them? I, I think uh, you know, great question, right? You know, whenever you work on a in an emerging field like AI and ML, and when you go into these large organisations, uh, for my personal experiences. Uh, a, you got to be a good listener, right, for a fact. Mm. Uh, just try to understand uh, different perspectives, welcome them, uh, because diversity in, uh, you know, in context is very critical to be successful as a product manager. Now, the second thing is, um, yeah, you know, every organization is going to be like Swiss cheese with plenty of holes. you got to be, uh, you know, you got to anchor on which holes of interest articulate why those holes are important to fix because clear articulation gets much respect within the community and why you want to address them. And uh, three, I would say, uh, be a strong orator, be technically savvy. You've got to mm. be able to explain your problem statement quite well enough and be high level and abstract enough that you, know, you, you don't get into specifics on how to get it done, right? This is where creativity comes in when you work with your engineering counterparts is, they deliver the how part, you deliver the vision part, right? Obviously, mm. you know, work hand in hand with them, encourage their creativity, encourage their productivity. Choices will always have to be made because you're never going to have enough resources to get things done. Um, so I think, you know, a combination of these things uh, really help to be successful. And in any given organization, you know, there's always going to be ups and downs, right? So never be distracted with the downs. Always look at why things did not work. Use it as a boost of encouragement to push it for the next goal. And that's how I would probably, you know, um, I've always told young product managers or joint organizations, especially in the field of AI, is always be a constant listener and on mm. top of it, be a constant learner because in AI, there's no specialist because the field is uh, adapting and changing so rapidly and so fast. What I've learned five years ago uh, now is being taught, uh, you know, in high school. 
So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be you know I wouldn't be uh, surprised in five years from now, the same context and subject is taught for first graders again. Yeah, stretching it a little bit more, but you know that's how the world has changed. Agreed. I've only got to look at my daughter's homework to understand that yeah, I certainly wouldn't be able to tackle these questions when I was at her age. So it's uh, yeah, exactly. It's an, inter- it's an interesting space, and I think product management is obviously now. Product manager has always been a function, but AI and product manager is now gathering a lot of attention, as I alluded to earlier. And we're getting a lot of questions, um, simple questions like, how do I break into that? They may be a data scientist, they may be more on the BI side, they may be not in analytics at all. But in your experience, what makes a good kind of product manager? And I know you touched on kind of the ability to listen, but a good technically minded AI product manager. And how would someone switch tax and break into that space what, what advice would you give them so my recommendation for me i had a, uh, i was lucky enough i would say in my career right i had an opportunity to work as an engineer as a developer as an architect mm. uh, and you know even an operations lead so i was physically in the consumer site i was actually physically in a manufacturing facility so I actually got to see how things worked you know from get go so if there's an opportunity, I would recommend um, at least young budding product managers to spend most of their initial time on field because you got to learn what works, what doesn't work. Because I think that level of practical experience is extremely critical uh, because you know what you design on a whiteboard or on a PowerPoint is very different from practicality. And yeah. having that exposure and experience of practicality kind of induces your way of thought and your way of thinking, right? And suddenly you're trying to realize, okay, I should not be doing this because of A, B, and C reasons because you're able to connect to it. No, not everyone probably would have the luxury of having spent the time, you know, in different facets of manufacturing, different facets of the industry before jumping into a product management lifestyle. But if an opportunity does exist, I would say sit down with the customer, try to visit them, try to see how this entire chain kind of works through and kind of gives them an exposure on what not to do. And that kind of pretty much sets the foundations for what should be done. Yeah, I think interesting. that makes you know any product manager successful, at least in the AI space. Yeah, you, you did have a really uh, kind of classic path actually from kind of that real kind of technical role to obviously then moving into the more kind of commercial elements of product management. I, I suppose, does that make you more credible? Do you think in more of that you know, if you are really going to climb that ladder to that kind of product owner, the level you're at now within such a specialist domain, do you think it really does take someone to fun ultimately know the nuts and bolts of AI and data and, you know, a data science? Or do you think someone could still become a good uh, senior director of product without that technical background? I think they can. Uh, also, yeah. you know, I would stress on the fact is be humble enough, right? You know, certain mm. things you may not know, be bold enough to accept it that you don't know it yeah. and then have some one-to-one separate sittings with that specialist in that domain try to understand what it means uh, and as you you know try to uh, be self-sufficient in that knowledge perspective it kind of leaves you the foundation right and always try to be inclusive you know if a certain you know a person has a certain different set of views encourage those kind of views right and then try to understand how those views help a product and i think as you gain respect uh, especially when you don't have the uh, technical acumen in a certain field, goes a long way for you to be, or any person to be successful in that organization. Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. I think that curious mind, that kind of the humbleness, the desire to learn, I think these are yeah. these are characteristics, aren't they? These are traits you can't necessarily train, but actually what you can train them and give them is the knowledge. So yeah, I like that view. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the intro, obviously there's kind of a huge amount of attention on the generative AI space. There's investment everywhere. There's a lot of activity and noise currently, um, all with their own different use case, their own problem statements. But for you generally, what do you think the future holds for generative AI? I, I think, uh, firstly, uh, as I mentioned, generative AI has made AI relevant pretty much yeah. to all age groups, uh, including a 65-year-old mom. Yeah. Right? So, which is quite interesting. Now, from a use case perspective, I think uh, you've got plenty of applications across multiple domains. Uh, what I'm saying that is, if I take an, a segment like an automotive environment, right, and often my 
10 year old car has a breakdown and get all kind of flashing lights. I have no clue what the triangular red, <laughs> you know, or a green a rectangle actually means. And I have to start looking at a, a 200 page document and then start looking at those boxes. And, mm. and it's irritating at times, right? So I can go ask my dashboard, hey, I've got this signal, what does it mean? I get an instant response within 30 seconds, right? And it gives me the context because it has environmental information and it has the, you know, the context of why this has come through makes my job much more easier. So what I'm saying is productivity is going to significantly get boosted up, especially on use cases like automotive domain and not to mention, you know, personal computing environment. Same thing with the content creation. Content creation was quite manual in nature, especially for the gaming environment, where you got to have ton and ton of engineers actually create characters or scenic backgrounds, you know, what the jumps and the hoops is going to look like. And now with, you know, generative AI, I can actually simulate or mimic um, these, uh, you know, content creation backgrounds instantaneously, which is quite remarkable, which means the physical mm -hmm. development of a game environment is reduced from years to a couple of months, right? Uh, I can give you one more example as, you know, th there was a significant effort in moving towards L3 or L4 of automotive environment, which means you really didn't have to have data because you have to go through very stringent qualification cycles. And I can recollect at least some of the automotive vendors used to put these cars into test environment for, you know, thousands and thousands of miles because they had to collect data. And once they collect data, then they run the physical, I would say the entire pipeline to make sure, you know, moving towards semi-autonomy or full autonomy, they're able to predict a lot of these situations. And that yeah. takes years of work. But now with the generative content, I could create artificial videos, artificial scenes. I can force feed certain function and see if my system is about to fail. So which means it improves my simulation environment significantly. So what I'm saying is in the end, you know, I'm completely upbeat on how generative AI is going to really help uh, humankind in in content creation, content consumption, productivity, and plenty more areas, which only means it's a foundational layer. And as such, your use cases, uh, the applications is going to be even more enormous, you know, compared to, I would say, the initial trend of AI. I would pretty much quote Gen AI as AI 2.0 upcoming, uh, mm -hmm. minus their T2 kind of an environment. But, uh, you know, uh, it's significant. So really, uh, really excited about it. Yeah, likewise. And we, you know, in all different walks of life, I'm speaking to people who are either absolutely, you know, excited, you know, you cannot wait for the next reiteration of the AI journey. But there's on the flip side, there is a huge amount of people that are really worried. And I know what you're doing, you, you're obviously an advisor with the AI forum. Um, and my, I suppose my final point to you is how important do you think is the regulation and the governance of this this AI domain now? Because at the moment, there's still so the, the progression, the speed at which things are changing and adapting. People have a are rightly uh, concerned about what this may mean to them. Uh, but obviously, with the work you're doing, the advising, obviously California State, and from what you're seeing, how much of a hot topic is governance regulation right now? I think it's uh, quite important these days uh, for many, many reasons, right? Mm. A, you want to make sure the physical content being provided is uh, content authenticated, meaning it's not yeah. a duplicate of somebody's work. How do you do that? It's very difficult. Uh, how much of that content is actually produced by a machine or created by a human? It's a very fine line, right? So you have to put mm -hmm. some laws into making sure that is uh, done quite clearly. Second is user privacy. You know, in many generative AI applications, people start dumping in their code, dumping in their private information. And this becomes part of a training stack, especially for cloud-based environment. People need to be aware of the fact, hey, this information that you provide is gone or going to be used forever, right? Uh, quite recently, I think someone uh, sent me a quote saying that they actually tricked ChatGPT into providing Microsoft Pro license keys. Um, and it wow. actually pro you know, produced uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Pro actual keys, which worked. I don't know what kind of input prompts they provided and somehow Chad scary. Start produ <laughs> producing those prompts, right? So these are areas where uh, nobody has gone before. So governance is extremely key for eliminating bias, content authentication. How can you make sure the output information uh, is not derogatory, is childproof? All of that stuff kind of comes into play. So this is key. Uh, do we have everything figured out? Not yet. Uh, but this is where I think there's going to be an active area of research 
uh, working with a lot of research institutions, working with a lot of universities, working with the mm-hmm. government, and then try to make sure we put some, I guess, a certain policies around it. So I expect next six, 12, 18 months, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on that. And you'd also see, you know, Sam Al- Altman and few other folks actually actively pursuing it, which is actually a good sign. Absolutely. Um, and on the flip side of that, you're also going to see subsequent kind of uh, job functions opening up. You're going to start to see everyone's worried about what it's taking away, but what we probably fail to realize is what it's going to give us, you know, additional job responsibilities, different new products, new tools, new, as you said earlier, innovations, new content. I think it's uh, it's a fascinating space and one that I know you and Qualcomm are very much in. But no, thanks, uh, thanks Vinesh. It's been a really good conversation and I, uh, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, your morning to have a, have a conversation with me. I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of interested parties with this episode. Thanks, Alex, uh, once again for providing this opportunity. It was fun talking to you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.